will, let's open our Bibles to the book of Isaiah. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 35 for our study tonight. Isaiah 35, short chapter, only 10 verses, but as uh, with many things that we've studied in this series of lessons, their brevity uh, doesn't take away any of the power. And this is uh, a, a powerful prophecy about Jesus and about his kingdom, um, and one that needs to be uh, remembered and understood by us as Christians as well, because it describes really the, uh, the church, and not just the church, but the way of life that we are to live as citizens of the Lord's kingdom. So just a couple of minutes, I want to talk a little bit about the background here of this um, chapter. The book of Isaiah, of course, as we've mentioned, Isaiah's name means um, salvation is of Jehovah or Jehovah saves. <clears throat> and that becomes, of course, the theme of his book, that if you want to be saved, God is the only way that that can happen. And he uses that to talk about physical salvation of the nation of Israel going into captivity. If they want to come back out, they have to put their trust in God. But, of course, it also applies, and even you know, in a greater sense, to spiritual salvation. If we want to be saved from the captivity of sin, God is the only Savior. So in showing us and, and developing that theme, as God does through him, <clears throat> Isaiah writes about different aspects of what was going on nationally with uh, the land of Israel and also with the, the world powers. So in the first 12 chapters, Isaiah wrote about the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom, and he talked about the threat of punishment that was uh, over them, but also the hope of redemption. And in that, those chapters, there are some very specific prophecies about Jesus. And we've talked about uh, two of those. We talked about the mountain of the Lord's house, and we talked about uh, him being born of a virgin in this series of lessons. And so those prophecies, you know, shine out under that threat of darkness and destruction for Judah. Then in chapters 13 through 23, he talks about the judgment of the nations, and he starts with Babylon, and he goes through all the nations around Israel and Judah and how God is going to punish them for their sins. And then chapters 24 through 27 is a, a, a judgment of the world, and it's talking about both world powers in general and then specifically about, you know, worldliness and not just nations but people who live like the world, and uh, it's a very powerful section of the book. But then you come into chapter 28, and the section of the book that starts with 28 ends with our chapter tonight, chapter 35, and it's sometimes called the book of woes, but it's also the book of Zion, because there are two things that happen in these chapters. Isaiah pronounces woes upon those who, who don't trust in God, and therefore they don't obey him. So in chapter 28, there's a woe upon Judah. In chapter 29, there's a woe on people who try to hide from God and think that they can get away with their sins. Chapters 30 and 31, there's a woe upon those who rebel against God and who put their trust in men. And in that case, they were specifically trusting in the nation of Egypt to save them instead of God. In chapter 33, there's a woe upon Assyria, and in pronouncing the woe on Assyria, there's the assurance to Jerusalem that they'll have victory. And then in chapter 4, there's uh, God's judgment upon the nations, and he specifically focuses in on Edom. But in the middle of all of that, in chapter 32, there's this picture of the Messiah and of his coming and the hope that that gives to the people of God. And so in this section, you have, uh, you know, kind of a long part about these woes upon those who are disobedient to God. And then you have this beautiful picture of the Messiah. And then there are a couple of other woes. And then it ends with chapter 35 that paints a contrast. All of these woes. And then there's this picture in chapter 35 of joy and rejoicing because salvation is of Jehovah, and God is going to save his people in returning them from captivity. But more than that, what this chapter is about, of course, is the coming of Jesus, 
and the salvation that he will provide through his sacrifice on the cross. So while this section is a book of woes, it's also the book of Zion because what is described is that um, dwelling place, that homeland, that kingdom that the Messiah would establish and the blessings that will be in it for the faithful. And this is not, you know, a physical kingdom, but a, a spiritual one. So that's kind of the, the background leading up to chapter 35. And with that in mind, I want us to start at verse 1. And we'll read the first four verses and break down this chapter into its three parts and uh, have the picture painted for us, uh, a beautiful picture of what Jesus brought into the world. So verse 1 says, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. So again, we come back to that theme, salvation is of Jehovah, so keep your trust in God. But in this section, we learn about joy in the desert. Now, if you back up to chapter 33, there, there's two ideas about the desert and the wasteland that are found in this section of the book. In chapter 34, where he talks about Edom, he describes Edom as a desert because they're going to be destroyed and, and devastated uh, because they're the enemies of God. But back in chapter 33, and uh, verses 8 and 9, he used that same kind of language to talk about Israel. And here's what he says. The highways lay waste, the wayfaring man ceaseth. He hath broken the covenant, he hath despised the cities, he regardeth no man. The earth mourneth and languisheth, Lebanon is ashamed and hewn down, Sharon is like a wilderness, and Bashan and Carmel shake off their fruits. So the picture is of devastation. It's the picture of Israel laid waste because of how cruel the Assyrians were when they came in and conquered them. Now, keep in mind that Isaiah prophesies before this happens and leading up to the carrying away of Israel, and then he carries on uh, in talking about Judah. But this was what was going to take place and what did take place. And so the very fruitful and prosperous land of Israel is pictured as a desert. And notice that he mentions Lebanon. We when we read Lebanon, you know, in the Bible, we're often reading about the cedars of Lebanon, the place known for those great trees. You know, they were cut down and used for building of the temple. So it's, it's a very fertile and productive land. When we read about Sharon, what do we think of? The Rose of Sharon, right? It was known for, again, the flowers and the beauty of the land. Carmel was a mountain right and the mountain had the rain and all of that so fruitful land but here they're described as being laid waste and that's the judgment that's come upon them through Assyria because of their sins well when we come to chapter 35 what had been made a desert now begins to bloom and to bloom like a rose you've probably seen pictures that or maybe even television programs where, you know, people go to the desert and they film it when it's just sand and, you know, barren and there's nothing. And then a rainstorm will come through. And it's not a lot of rain like, you know, we think of a lot of rain, but it's just enough. And all of these plants, you know, come out of nowhere, it seems, and flowers begin to bloom. And it's a beautiful place for a brief moment of time because of the coming of the rain. Well, that's the picture here, that Israel has been barren and waste like a desert, but now with their return from captivity, it blooms again. Uh, the desert is, is made beautiful, and that can last if they will be faithful to God, or they can be taken away again. And ultimately, of course, it's going to focus in on spiritual things. So the captivity devastated Israel the land and also the people, but when they're allowed to return, when God grants them uh, the right to come back home, there's going to be great rejoicing. 
And that's what this passage is about. It's picturing the children of Israel returning from captivity to the land of, uh, of Canaan, the land of Palestine. Uh, but there's still a spiritual you know, note to the passage. It's not just about the physical return uh, from captivity. And we know that because ultimately uh, what is described here didn't happen until the time of the Messiah. When the children of Israel came back to their homeland, they were still oppressed by other nations. Uh, so after they come out of Assyrian captivity, which became Babylonian captivity, they were then under the rule you know, of the Persians, uh, and then later the Greeks, and then later the, uh, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, and ultimately the Romans. And at the time of Jesus, they were you know, occupied by Rome. And so what he's talking about here is, you know, freedom away from, you know, being captive or held captive by other lands. But that didn't really happen through the rest of their history. It only happens with the coming of the Messiah. Jesus gives true freedom from sin, which is ultimately what this passage is about. So the wilderness and the desert bloom and rejoice. Haley wrote in his commentary, uh, the point is that, from, uh, is that from unsightly spiritual life, there will come beauty of character and sweet incense of the spirit. And that's the, the spiritual side of this passage. They had become morally bankrupt, and because of that, they'd been taken into captivity. But when they come back, they'll do so with the right kind of spirit. And again, ultimately, in the time of Christ. Now, what does that mean? It means that if we know, you know, if we're the children of Israel and we know that God is going to bring us back out of captivity, then there is um, this, this promise and the hope that goes with it, and that motivates us to be strong and to endure so that we can receive what God has told us will happen. And because of that, there's no need to fear. So strengthen the weak hands. Make your hands strong. Confirm the feeble knees. Don't be bowed down with the, the weight of you know, what you're going through, but stand up straight and strong and tall and don't be afraid because of who God is. So he says, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. So when God is in control, there's no need to fear. And that's the lesson that they needed uh, to learn and, of course, to be reminded of. Back in chapter 28 and verse um, 16, Isaiah says this, <clears throat> chapter 28, 16, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. And if you remember, we talked about this stone. It would be rejected by many but for those who accepted it, it becomes the cornerstone. Well, that's Jesus. And because of that, there is hope and there's no need to fear. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7 says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, not a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God doesn't want his people to be afraid and to be fearful. And we don't have to be when God is in control. And he always is. We just have to, uh, have to remember that. So there's the promise that they're going to return from captivity, and that caused joy in the desert. But if you notice in verse 5, we now see a second aspect of this, that it's not only the, the desert becoming blossoming and flowering, but there's the spiritual side with the healing of the soul. He says in verse 5, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. And the habitation of dragons, where each lay, shall be grass with reeds and rushes. When we read that passage, we begin to understand that he's obviously not just talking about physical things. Because when the children of Israel came back from captivity, uh, everybody wasn't healed of their sicknesses. There would still be blind people and deaf people, those who couldn't speak and so forth. That still happened. So he's not talking about 
merely physical things, but he's talking about spiritual. And we know that furthermore because of uh, Jesus in Matthew 11. In verse number 2, it says, Now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? So John the Baptist, which is you know a fascinating part of his story, um, but one we ought to be thankful that God included, after he had you know done all of the, the work that he did in preparing the way for Jesus, when he was arrested and was sitting in prison, right, after doing all this good work and all of God's will, what did he get out of it? He, he got a jail cell, and eventually he's going to be beheaded. But while he's sitting in jail, he begins to wonder, was I wrong about all this? Is Jesus really the Messiah? Is he the one that we've waited for? And that ought to encourage us that even John the Baptist had doubts, and not encourage us that he doubted, but when we doubt, we know that it's a part of life. Sometimes we have questions and we don't know the answers. But we need to do what John did. When he had his doubts, he went to the source. He went to Jesus and he said, Are you he? Are you the Messiah, the one we've been waiting for? John just needed some reassurance. And we all do from time to time. Sadly, times when we doubt, we start looking everywhere else. Instead of going to God's word and to finding out what he says about it, we start listening to what men say, and it only increases our doubt. But when John sent these disciples to Jesus, here's what he said in verse 4. He answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Now, notice something that Jesus did not say to John. He didn't say, how dare you doubt me? How dare you question whether or not I am the Messiah? I can't believe that you did all of these good things and now you, you're having these doubts. Jesus didn't reprimand him for asking the question. Instead, he gave him the answer. He gave him the evidence that he needed. And the Lord knows he's lived here on this earth. He knows what we go through and what we experience. He knows there are going to be questions and doubts. He just wants us to come to him for the answers, and he'll provide them for us. And that's what he did for John. But notice what he says here. He talks about what we're reading in Isaiah 35, the blind receiving their sight, the deaf being able to hear, and those things. Now, Jesus is talking about the miracles that he performs, obviously, and that's part of you know the evidence for John and uh, for those in his day and for us still today of you know the nature of Christ and who he was but it's also pointing to the greater work that Jesus was doing which is spiritual he didn't come into the world just to open the ears of deaf people he came into the world to open ears to the truth of the gospel and healing deaf people was a physical representation of what he was doing spiritually. Jesus didn't come into the world just to make blind people see. He did it on occasion, but there were many other blind people that he didn't heal of their blindness, but it teaches a spiritual lesson. He wanted eyes to be opened to the truth. Jesus didn't come into the world to heal physical sickness. He came into the world to save souls. And the healing of the physical sick demonstrated his power and confirmed that he could, you know, what he was teaching was the truth. And it also illustrated the spiritual principle that we could be healed from the sickness of sin. And that's ultimately, you know, the point there. And so the spiritual desert that's talked about in Isaiah 35 is going to be revived. And it will be revived with living water. We know in John chapter 4 when Jesus spoke with the woman at the well that he talked about this principle of living water. And I want to read just a couple of verses here to remind us of that. John chapter 4, of course, they were at Jacob's well. So there's a physical illustration of a spiritual truth. He wanted a drink of water and he asked that of her. Uh, and he said, give me to drink in verse 7. And then, you know, she was aston uh, astonished that he even uh, spoke to her. 
But in verse 10, he answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. She says in verse 11, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. How are you going to give me water? You don't even have a bucket and, and a rope, and it's, it's deep. He's not talking about that kind of water. She said, From whence then hast thou that living water? And then she asked this question, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? This well's been here for generations. Jacob dug this well. And you're saying you're better than him? You've got a better source of water than what Jacob, you know, dug for us? Absolutely he did. Was he better than Jacob? Absolutely he was. And his water wasn't physical. He says, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He's talking about water, but it's a spiritual water, the quenching of a spiritual thirst. And that's what Isaiah is foretelling, that a desert land, no water, is going to be filled with water so that there can be life in the desert. And again, that's spiritual life, not just physical life. In John 7 and 38, Jesus said, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39 says, This he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So there again is that fellowship that we have with God, that intimate relationship, like we studied this morning in Bible class. God adopts us into his family as his children, which enables him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to dwell in us and us to dwell in them. And we have communion and relationship and fellowship. And God is our Father, and we call him Abba, Father, and he loves us and cares for us. That's life in the desert. We don't deserve that, and our sins separate us from it. But God made possible the bringing of us into his family. And that's the living water that's available through the blood of Christ. So the spiritual desert comes alive with water. In verse 7 where he talks about parched ground, the word that is used there is actually the word for a mirage. So you think about the desert, right? And we see it in movies. Sometimes, you know, you can see a kind of a, a representation of it on a highway that's, that's really hot. I've seen even pictures of in, in other places where, you know, it gets really hot and there's this layer of uh, air uh, between the sky you know and the ground and you can actually see it looks like cities up in the sky but it's just a reflection from the heat and so forth but it's not really there it's just an image and it looks like it so you're in the desert and you're you're thirsty and the the heat you know plays tricks on you and you see what looks like an oasis and there's a place for water and you run to it and there's nothing there it was just a, an image that's the word that's used here and what he says is that something that is barely visible, right? It's like shimmering and wavery and, and it doesn't look real, but it's going to become real. The mirage will actually become a pool of water. And that's what the New Testament does for us. It takes the shadows of the old and makes them real. And that's you know the whole point of types and anatypes. And, you know, shadows being fulfilled. It's the whole point of prophecy that we get glimpses of it in the Old Testament, but then we find the real thing in the New Testament. And that's why when we study books like Galatians in our Bible class, when we find people wanting to leave the New Testament to go back to the old, it's like leaving the oasis to go back to the mirage. There's nothing there. You're only going to get dry sand. There's no living water. There's no flowers, there's no life, because that system has ended. And Jesus has established his new covenant. And Hebrews teaches us it's a far better covenant. What we have in Christ is better than anything they had under the law of Moses. And I think it's important to remember that. Sometimes we get caught up on miracles, and we wish that we could see a miracle. And if I could just see a miracle, you know, everything would be you know, okay. Well, they had miracles, but they didn't have what you and I have in Christ. Christ. 
It didn't even come close. What we have is so far greater, we have the reality. And so this mirage will become a pool, and then not just a pool, it says the thirsty land springs of water. And so the idea is that the whole desert becomes a well-watered meadow. That's the power of Christ and of the gospel. So, of course, that never happened literally in the, the land of Canaan, in the area of Palestine, following Israel's captivity. This is not meant to be taken literally. It's spiritual. And it's talking about the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. Well, that brings us to verse 8 in the last part of this chapter. He says, And an highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those. The wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And so the last part of this chapter has to do with the road of the redeemed, the high way. Uh, and so the picture is, of course, Israel is in captivity. They're going to go back to their homeland, and God pictures it as, as though there's a highway that's been built. There's a road that's been paved, as it were, all the way from Assyria back, back to their home in, in Israel. Now, again, that's not literal. It didn't actually happen. But he's using that to illustrate the spiritual picture about being forgiven, being ransomed from sin. So this beautiful desert that's made into a, a you know, well-watered meadow where there's living water and there's you know, abundance of life and all spiritual blessings in Christ, there's only one way to get to it. And that way is the highway. It's called the way of holiness. So you can imagine, you know, the interstate. And sometimes you're driving down the road and there'll be a sign and this road will be named after some man who did something or, or whatever. Well, this road, the name of it is the way of holiness. And it's a, a way, meaning it's a path, a road, but it's a highway. It's elevated. And so we, we're talking about a way of living, a way of life that is high and that is holy. It's elevated above the common. So it's called a highway because it's lifted up, it's built up, it's elevated both physically and morally. So we talk about taking the high road. That's the idea here. The root word used means to mound up, um, especially a turnpike. So if you're going to build a road, you know, you build up under it so you can, uh, you know, it'll stand and withstand the traffic and whatever. Sometimes you have to build it up to go over other things that would get in the way. But it's that idea of exalting and raising up a thoroughfare that leads to Zion. And the point here is that when God sends Jesus into the world to uh, fulfill his, his plan of the ages and to accomplish salvation for all men, God didn't do that in some way that was secret. He wants everybody to know about it, so much so that he builds a highway so you can get to him. Um, God hasn't you know, put us here lost in sin and put salvation over here and then covered the road with, with roadblocks and with stumbling blocks and everything to get in our way to try to keep us from getting to him. God made it a highway. Now, sometimes the devil puts stumbling blocks in the way, but God hasn't done that. He's made a clear path to get to him, to live with him forever in heaven. And that way is a high way. It's called high because it's elevated. It's called a way because it's a road. And it's a road on which the righteous travel. Now, when we understand that this is a morally elevated road, we understand that it means that we have to live a certain way, that we are called to a higher standard by the gospel of Christ. And so you think about passages like in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus tells us to turn the other cheek. 
right? Someone does something to us and it harms us and our inclination is to retaliate. You hit me, I'm going to hit you back. You said something bad about me, I'm going to say something bad about you, right? That's taking the low road. And if we respond in that way, we've gotten off the highway and we're down on the low road. What does Paul tell us to do? He says, if, you know, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. And by so doing, you'll heap coals of fire on his head, right? We're not supposed to return in kind, but to take the high ground, the high moral path. That's the idea of this highway that's being talked about here. And so it's a way, it's a road, it's a path of life that we walk, but it's of a higher moral standard because it's the way of holiness. So it's a way that is high and that is holy. And what that means is being holy is that the unclean shall not uh, pass over it. Those who are unclean because of sin cannot travel on this road. That's Matthew 7, 13 and 14. There's a broad way and there's a narrow way. Most people choose the broad path because their sins will fit through the broad gate and, and go down the broad path. But the narrow way is straight and narrow, right? It's straight. It's pressed in close. You may even have to squeeze to get in there, and it's a very narrow path. But it's the way to salvation because in order to walk that path, you have to get rid of your sins. You can't bring them with you. And so those who are unclean, they're not holy. They can't walk on this path. And so if you and I want to walk this way that leads to heaven, we have to be holy people. That is, forgiven of our sins, walking in the light of God's word, so that the blood of Jesus continues to wash away those sins. 1 John 1 and verse 7. He goes on to say that uh, it shall be for those. And the idea there is that um, it's the way of holiness and it is for those who walk on it in holiness is the idea. It belongs to those who are the redeemed. Then he says, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. People who despise wisdom will not take this path. You know, that's what we talked about in our sermon this morning. People who will not listen to God's wisdom but follow their own wisdom, they're never going to start down this road because this road is a narrow way and it's a straight way and you can't, you know, take all the other things that you want with you. You have to leave it all behind and just follow God and his will. And so there's a place for wise people, but not for fools. Verse 9 says, No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast. So those who seek to destroy or to devour are not going to be found on this road. A person who has that kind of attitude um, is not going to obey the gospel, and if they have and start having this attitude, they're not faithful to the Lord, right? And so they're not going to be on this, on this highway, which, by the way, reminds us of the importance of withdrawal of fellowship. If a child of God goes astray and becomes a destroyer, and by the life that they're living or the doctrine that they're teaching, they're destroying the church, they have to be separated from it because they're not on God's road anymore. And we have to acknowledge that for their sake and also for the sake of the church. But those who destroy will not walk this path. Instead, it is a road for the redeemed. The redeemed shall walk there. The unclean, those who are foolish, the ravenous beast, they can travel on this road if they will change their nature. If they'll stop being ravenous beasts, if they'll stop being foolish, if they'll stop being unclean and submit in obedience to God, then they too can walk on this way. But the only way to do that, of course, is through Christ, to become one of the redeemed by the blood of Jesus. So the way's open to everybody. Anyone can walk on it, but few will. And those who do are the ones who obey the gospel of Christ. Now notice verse 10, the ransomed of the Lord shall return. So someone's paid a price, purchased our freedom, and, and bought us into this fellowship with God. Well, Jesus did that through, uh, of course, through his blood on the cross. And so the ransomed are the ones who walk on this path. And as they do, they come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. And so we'll pass through the wilderness, walk through this desert that's become 
you know, a well-watered, fertile meadow, and we'll find our way to salvation, spiritual Zion, which is the church, and then ultimately to that wonderful home in heaven. All the sorrow and the sighing of life is traded for the joy and gladness that we find in Christ. That's why there's singing in the Lord's church. That's why God made singing, or at least partly why God made singing part of our worship, because of what we have in Jesus. We ought to sing about it. We ought to want to sing about it because of what God has done for us. Read a couple of verses from Hebrews just to illustrate this. In Hebrews 12 and verse 22, the Bible says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. That's where we are in the church. That's the ones we're in fellowship with. That's the relationship that we have. In chapter 10 and verse 19, he says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And that's the passage that tells us to draw near and to hold fast and to consider one another, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Why? Because we have a new and living way. If we're walking on this high way, we want to be with the people who are also on this high way. They're the best people in the world. And so we want to be with them, so we assemble to give thanks to God for what he's given us in the church. And that's the beauty of what the Lord has done and the sacrifice that he's made and what he's provided for us. In chapter 1 and verse 2 of Hebrews, the Bible says that God, you know, spoke in time past. But now he's in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. In Christ, through the New Testament, the Son of God is the one who speaks to us. And again, you don't find that anywhere else except in the Lord's church. Now, I want us to close by really quickly going through a few passages here in Isaiah and notice how God describes this, this highway. The title of our lesson is Signs on the Highway. Here, here are the signs. Here's the path that God has made for us. Listen to what he says. Chapter 11 and verse 16. God says, There shall be an highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. So this highway is like it was when God delivered them from Egypt. What does that mean? Well, he parted the Red Sea and he made a way. That's the highway that they traveled. How badly did God want them out of bondage and into freedom? He parted the Red Sea. How badly does God want us out of sin and into fellowship with him and to live with him forever in heaven? He parts the Red Sea. Not literally, of course, but he makes the way through the sacrifice of his son. Chapter 40, verses 3 and 4, which we're going to talk about in, in a future lesson. But it says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So this is the work of John the Baptist. He's going to make a highway in the desert for God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. How badly does God want us to get to him? He brings the mountains down low. He raises the valleys up high so it's perfectly flat and level. If you want to get to Jesus, you don't have to climb a mountain to be there. You just have to walk straight to him because God has made that road for us. And he wants us to be with him that badly. Chapter 42 and verse 16 says, I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do and not forsake them. How badly does God want us to get to him? He gives us the light to show us the way. We may be blind in spiritual darkness, but the light of truth shines through the gospel, and God guides us through that directly to him on this way that he's made. And then two more verses, chapter 57 and verse 14. He says this. Went too far. 57, 14. He shall say, 
Cast ye up, cast ye up, prepare the way, take up the stumbling block out of the way of my people. So build up the road and remove all the stumbling blocks. That's what God does because he wants us to find our way to him. And then chapter 62 and verse number 10. Go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people, cast up, cast up the highway, gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. And so not only does God build up the road, not only does he remove the stumbling blocks, not only does he lower the mountains and raise the valleys, not only does he take all the curves out of the road and makes it perfectly straight, but then he sets up a standard. There's a flag that's marching it, marking rather, where this place is. God puts up a huge billboard, a neon sign that's flashing brightly. This is the place where salvation is. And what that is, of course, is the cross of Christ. God says, this is where you need to go, and this is the way to get there. He's done everything possible to show us the way to salvation because he wants us to be with him forever and forever. That's how much he loves you and how much he loves me. He's prepared this way, and he did it through the ages of the world, through all these prophecies that we're seeing. God brought it all to pass by bringing Jesus into the world as our Savior. That's why in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way. If we want to go to the Father, if we want to live with him and fellowship with him now and eternally in heaven, we have to walk this highway. And it's not hidden. It's brightly illuminated marked clearly this is the way to salvation hear the gospel believe it believe in jesus repent of your sins cast all those off so you can start on this path and then obey him as you confess your faith in christ be baptized for the remission of sins and you start your journey on this straight and narrow way that leads to eternal life in heaven if you need to start that journey tonight we can help you you can put on christ in baptism if you've begun the journey but you've gotten off the path if you've taken the low road if you've been led astray by the devil if you followed your own directions instead of god's come back to god's way repent of your wrongs confess that you've done wrong ask him to forgive and he will he longs to the the sign is flashing this is where you need to be and if you need to come to him to find that salvation then you have that opportunity to do it. Why not respond as we stand and as we sing? Safely walk with